story is told of a young physicist, Fritz Hudemann. One summer evening, he was feeling exhilarated as he strolled down a quiet street in the old university town of Gottenden, Germany. His girlfriend was at his side. She sensed his mood, looked up at the night sky and said softly, look up at the stars, aren't they beautiful? Yes, replied the young physicist, and do you know, you are holding hands with the only man alive who knows why they shine. He was telling the literal truth. That very day, Hooterman had discovered what the nuclear reactions were that gave the stars and our own sun their radiant energy. I think it's good to start a lesson on radiation with this story, because when most people think of radiation, they think only of the dangers. And like everything else in science and society, there are at least two sides to the story, and we have a lot to learn about both. Though radiation is as old as the universe itself, penetrating the mysteries of radiation has only just begun. The first radiation to be studied was light, visible light. From ancient times, people have been fascinated by light, and with good reason. Some people worshiped the sun, the source of this radiant gift. Farmers knew that light was needed to grow crops. Sailors knew that light brought changes in the weather, and everyone knew that light brought warmth, sight, and beauty. But no one knew what light was, how it was made, how it moved, what happened to it when it disappeared. At the dawn of science in ancient Greece, scientists like Anaximander, Aristotle, and Democritus wondered about light, and they made up theories to explain it. Democritus, for example, said light was made of tiny little bullets streaming away from sources like the sun. These little bullets would bounce off whatever they hit, warming it in the process. Euclid even formulated some laws to describe how light was reflected from mirrored surfaces and how it bent when it went through water or glass. One of the first scientists to solve some of the mysteries of color almost 2,000 years after Democritus and Euclid was Isaac Newton. Working alone at his country home in Woolsthorpe, England, where he retired to escape the plague in 1665, Newton used a prism to break up sunlight into colors. The colored rays he found could not be further separated. They could be put back together, however, to make white light again. Thus said Newton, contrary to what was commonly believed at the time, it is white light that is the mixture. Each of the colors is its own pure ray. Newton, like Democritus, said that each colored ray must be a stream of tiny particles, since light always cast sharp shadows and did not bend to go around corners the way a wave would. It took over a hundred years to prove that Newton was wrong on this last point. It happened when Thomas Young, in November 24, 1803, performed a simple, elegant experiment in front of the Royal Society in London. Light was not a particle, but it was a wave, said Young, and here is the proof. He shone a thin beam of light through two small holes. He pointed triumphantly to the telltale bands of light and dark streaks that appeared on the screen behind the holes. Just look, said Young, if you split a beam of light, you do get bending. Just like a wave, light produces patterns of light and dark bands as the light waves cancel and add to one another. If light was a simple stream of tiny particles, these bands of dark and light could not happen. Young later figured out in his experiments the actual wavelengths of light, which turned out to be very small, smaller than a millionth of a meter. This did not end the controversy, however, over whether light was a wave or a particle. In fact, the controversy has continued right down to our own day. And the scientific view today is that light is both a wave and a particle. Let's look at how Newton's and Young's work opened the door to the widening spectrum of radiation. They studied the visible spectrum from red to yellow to blue and violet. Soon other scientists were finding that there was invisible light, 
That is, there was radiation that fanned out on either side of this visible spectrum in a much broader rainbow of color. There was not only violet light, there was an ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light could not be seen with the eye, but when it shone on certain minerals, it made these minerals glow with what came to be called a black light. And off at the other end of the spectrum, after red light, there was found to be an infrared light that one could not see, but one could feel as warmth. More progress was made in the middle of the 19th century, expanding still more the spectrum of radiation. Pioneers like the Englishman Michael Faraday, the Dane Hans Christian Orsted, the Italian Alessandro Volta, and the American Joseph Henry made slow progress in discovering new facts about electricity and magnetism. Electricity moving through a wire, it was found, would affect a magnetic needle, and vice versa. A moving magnet would make electricity flow through a wire. The basic principles were there for later construction of electric motors and generators, and more important for our subject, new questions came up. What was the field surrounding magnets and electrical conductors. Something seemed to radiate out from these strange magnets and electrical devices. Did it have anything to do with the radiation we already knew something about? In the middle of the 19th century, the Scottish physicist and mathematician James Clerk Maxwell found some answers to these questions. Surrounding any current carrying wire, said Maxwell, is a moving out field of electromagnetic waves. And amazing fact, these electromagnetic waves act very much like visible light waves. Like visible light waves, electromagnetic waves reflect, refract, and are absorbed. And, and here was the clincher, they move at the same speed and follow the same mathematical laws as light. Well, suddenly the spectrum of radiation was multiplied many fold. Not only do we have red, yellow, and blue light, not only do we have ultraviolet and infrared light, now we have a whole new world of radiating electromagnetic waves, all with longer wavelengths and lower frequencies than visible light. Later, these longer wavelength, lower frequency waves of radiation came to be known as the familiar radio, television, radar, and microwave frequencies. Well, how about the other end of the spectrum? Could there be electromagnetic waves with shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies than ultraviolet? Yes, indeed. Though it took another 50 years to discover such waves, the first ones to be discovered were the ones just shorter and just higher frequencies than ultraviolet, called X-rays. The discovery of X-rays by the German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895 was an international sensation. Working with vacuum tubes, he bombarded a metal plate with high-speed electrons, and he found that invisible rays were generated. These mysterious new rays would go through skin and flesh and give a picture of a person's bones. His x-rays became world famous, as well as world misunderstood. A legislator in New Jersey, for instance, introduced a bill banning the use of x-rays in opera glasses in order to preserve the modesty of ladies. Well, x-rays soon found many valuable uses in medicine and in industry. It was, unfortunately, quite a few years later that a harmful side of x-rays was also discovered. They could be harmful to living tissue, it was found, or they could even cause cancer if the exposures were too great or too prolonged. So too, the next discovery in our radiation story, radioactivity. Here too, the first breakthroughs were made about the same time, around the turn of the century. Shortly after Ronchin discovered X-rays, a Frenchman, Henri Becquerel, stumbled upon another kind of radiation. He found that the element uranium spontaneously gave off rays that would darken photographic plates, 
as did x-rays, but these were not x-rays. Marie Curie and her husband Pierre worked long hours in a drafty garage laboratory in Paris to isolate a new element, radium, that gave off very powerful new rays. What were these new rays? New forms of radiation? Well, experiments were done all over the world. Scientists found that some of the rays coming out of radium and uranium did act like electromagnetic waves. They were weightless, they traveled at the speed of light, and they obeyed all of the mathematical equations that Maxwell had discovered for the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, these were later called gamma rays, and indeed they were a part of the electromagnetic spectrum with shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies than X-rays. Besides those gamma rays, there were at least three other radioactive rays that seemed to come out of the nucleus of radium and uranium. Each of these three kinds of rays acted quite differently from the others. And none of these three new kinds of radiation was a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, what were they then? Well, one kind of ray turned out to be very heavy particles that were easily stopped by a piece of paper or by the skin. A stream of them could be bent by a magnetic or electrical field. They were charged positively. They were named alpha particles. The alpha particle was later found to be identical to the nucleus of the element helium. Another kind of radiation coming out of the nucleus was also made of particles, but these particles were much lighter and they moved much faster. They were more penetrating and they were bent in the opposite direction by magnetic or electrical fields. These rays were named beta rays. Beta rays were found later to be identical to electrons. And finally, in certain rare cases, still another kind of radiation seemed to come out of elements like uranium. These were particles too, but they were not affected at all by magnetic or electrical fields. They were named neutrons. Neutrons were emitted when a uranium nucleus fissioned. That is, when it split in two or more parts, and in the splitting emitted very large amounts of energy as well. In the 20th century, physicists learned where these electromagnetic waves came from. All of them, except the gamma rays, came from leaps of electrons inside of atoms or from vibrations of atoms and molecules. Engineers soon learned to control these electron leaps, these atomic vibrations. The result was radio, television, microwave ovens, computer circuits, and the whole new world of electronic marvels. It was a somewhat different story with the other basic kind of radiation, the kind that comes out of radioactive elements like radium and uranium the kind that is associated nowadays with nuclear energy. Here the radiation came not from the leaping electrons of the outer atom, but rather from the cracking apart of the nucleus of certain atoms. In the case of naturally radioactive elements like radium and uranium, their nuclei are continually and randomly breaking apart. From this breaking apart we get alpha, beta, and gamma rays exploding out at high speeds and dangerous momentums. When special kinds of uranium atoms nuclei actually split in two, still another kind of radiation is emitted, high-speed neutrons. This happens in a controlled way in a nuclear power plant and in an uncontrolled way in a nuclear bomb. This atom splitting process is called nuclear fission. And finally, when certain kinds of very light hydrogen atoms combine, well, that is when their nuclei combine, we also get radiation. In this case, we get the kind of radiation that Fritz Hudermans had figured out on that summer evening in Göttingen, Germany. The kind of radiation that our sun and our stars emit, the kind of atom combining process that we call nuclear fusion. How all of these kinds of radiation affect living things like us is the subject of the second part of this program, Radiation and You.